welcome to Maple Avenue Ministries. Please join us in worship. Join me in confession. Psalm 16, 
says, keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely, I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. God, sometimes it's difficult for us to remember that you are in control when things batter us, when they shake us, when they remove the foundational pieces that we think are from under us. Sometimes we lose our footing and then our heads about us. We pray that you might forgive us for the times we have not trusted, for the times we have moved when you said don't move for the times that we have been petrified and stood still when you have told us to move god forgive us be our shield and our portion and the lifter of our heads in jesus name amen saints of god the lord is gracious and loving and kind and forgiving and declares that you will be forgiven if you but ask. Thank you, God, for that gift of forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Saints, welcome to Maple Avenue Ministries, a church in the heart of the city with the city in its heart. Would you take a few moments to digitally greet each other, or if you are in the house or in your car standing still or in a restaurant would you greet people let them know and let us know where you're uh, watching us from we'd appreciate that
Well, good morning, Mamily. It is such a blessing to be here in the Lord's house today. It has been too long for me. Um, so it's such a good, just so good to be back here. Um, just a couple of things. Thank you so much for the offerings that we continue to receive. Um, there's still plenty of time to give. If you haven't, just visit any of the many giving options that we have or the Manly Facebook page if you would like more opportunities. Just a reminder, next week we are doing our uh, baptism service. So please sign up for that. We are be, we'll be observing the social distancing to um, try to keep everyone safe, try to keep everyone healthy. So please sign up for that. Um, also online, right? Yeah, online. So, uh, my name is Nathaniel Ryan. I'm the intern here uh, at Maple Avenue. It is such a blessing to, again, just be here this morning and to, to bring the word of the Lord to you. Um, so, without any further ado, let us please pray before entering into the word today. Oh God, your word is more precious than gold. Your word is sweeter than the purest of honey. As we turn to your scripture, send your Holy Spirit to infuse your word with truth, truth and grace so that the good news of your love would shine before our eyes and delight our senses so that we cannot help but respond with wonder, faith, and trust. Amen. The word of the Lord this morning comes from Ephesians 6.10. We ask that, or here at Maple Avenue, we, we rise for the reading of the word, so we'd ask that either in body or in spirit, we would rise together and hear the word of the Lord. So Ephesians 6.10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against the enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put, the best bless, put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet put on the gospel put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these Take the shield of faith, which you'll be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Growing up, one of my favorite t-shirts of all time was a t-shirt that my dad had on it, there was a knight in full armor. And in, in one arm, he had this magnificent sword. You know the type of sword that, that is so wide and so long that it would actually be impossible to have in real life, impossible to hold, let alone impossible to drag across the ground because it's so large. And the other he had a shield. And across from him, the knight had his back to the viewer, across from him was a giant dragon, uh, green and scaly with red eyes. And underneath the night there, it just said, put on the full armor of God. Now, I used to sit for the longest time and just stare at this shirt. You know, it, it feels kind of weird, but I would just stare at this shirt for hours. You know, we'd, we'd be doing laundry, and then I'd just lay it down on the table and then just kind of sit and stare. I used to stare because I would, I would imagine what was going on here. What is this battle that is, that is happening? Where is, where is this, this knight trying to go? This dragon is, is both larger and stronger. Where would this battle 
happen? What, what, what would this knight be doing? What, what type of, of, of maneuver would he, he have to go through? Where would he climb? What, uh, what strengths, what uh, feats of, of abilities would he have to do to slay this dragon? And I often used to thought, how can I be this knight? Wouldn't that be cool? To fight a dragon. The crazy thing about this graphic was that so much of my Christian worldview was based on this graphic. This idea that somehow I need to go out and I need to slay. I need to win. I need to conquer this dragon of sin, of, of, of death, this dragon. I need to go be the, the conqueror. Both sin and Satan were enemies that I needed to face and vanquish. And I only could do so if I armored up in the right way. And that meant everything. If, if, I, was, if I was angry, I needed to pray more. If I was lusting, I needed to read the Bible more. If I was coveting, I needed to become just more righteous. The goal was to win, to conquer. And if I didn't win then, if I didn't win the, the battle against Satan, against sin, then it was shame. I didn't wear enough armor. I didn't put it on. I wasn't a good enough Christian. And, and the sad thing is, is that it didn't just stay within my own life. I went on then to determine other people's spirituality by the suffering by their shortfalls, by their, their struggles. Are you struggling with sin? Well, you probably aren't praying enough. Are you unfaithful to your wife? Probably haven't been reading the Bible. You struggle with depression? Get the joy of the Lord. You struggle with anxiety? Nah, you don't trust Jesus. I went far on to even judge people's socioeconomic status because once you, once you determine that, that Christian life is determined on how much we conquer, then we go on and say that all of life is determined by how much we conquer. Help us today. Because it's easy, so easy to, to mix those all up. To define everything as conquered or conquer as winner or loser when you've been a conqueror in most areas of life. I think that's part of the reason that Jesus said in Matthew, it's harder for, or it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. Because anything can be, can be fit in there, it, rich, uh, it's strong in power, great economical status, anything. It's harder for, for them to get to the heaven than, than an camel to go through a tiny eye of a needle because we lose track sometimes of how hopeless our true situation is when we get affixed with conquering and power because we know that true Christianity coming to the table coming to, to God coming to this house starts with knowing that we are the broken. We are the lost, the poor, and the needy. We are the conquered. It's for this reason that Paul in Ephesians here doesn't say so that we can go out and kill everyone or vanquish our enemies, but he just says the word to stand and to stand firm. I was reminded this past week of the story of Moses in Exodus 17, the battle against the Amalekites. 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 We read in Exodus that, that the Amalekites came to fight the Israelites in, um, in the wilderness as the Israelites are wandering. And, and Moses goes to Joshua and says, all right, Joshua, you take the Israelites and you go down and fight. And Joshua's like, all right, Moses, sweet. What are you going to do? And Moses says, all right, I'm going to go up on this hill and take the staff of the Lord. And Joshua's like, all right, I love where this is going. And Moses says, and I'm going to hold it above my head. And you know, this is the same staff that, that Moses broke a rock and water came forth. 
the same staff that, that purified drinking water. I only can imagine what Joshua is thinking when he hears Moses just say, I'm going to go up on a hill and hold up a stick. You, you go down there and I'll just hold this up stick. And that's what happened. Moses went up on the hill and he held up the stick. And Joshua was down in the valley fighting the Amalekites. And when Moses held the stick up in the air, the Israelites won. And when he let it fall, the Israelites were losing. I think this is a perfect image of what it means when Paul says to stand. Because we're not the ones doing the battle. We're not the ones that, that are doing the fighting. Paul, Jesus is saying, listen, be faithful to what we've got to give you. Hold up the stick in the air. Don't fall on the ground. Just stand. Just hold this stick because Jesus has already won the battle. Jesus continues to fight for us down in the muck and the mire. And we are asked to stand. Just stand, God says. Just stand and I will do the fighting. Just stand and I will mend your brokenness. I will give you strength. I will give you life that you can never and were never meant to achieve. I will send my own son to do what you never could do. I will fight. I will save. You stand. You hold up the stick. I will conquer. I will deliver. Just stand. I think it's easy for us humans to, to either do less or do more. I think that is why Paul focuses so much on the phrase to stand. Because Paul also uses the language others run the race. Don't beat your fists in the air. Run the race. Keep your feet underneath you. Stand. We're going to have enough of battle with the rulers and the authorities and the cosmic powers. They will assault you, so armor up and stand. Just hold that stick up. I think this sounds like a really easy command. But I can guarantee that each of us have had moments where our legs gave out and our arms collapsed. But here's where the great news continues. If you remember back to the story of Moses and the Amal Amalekites, I left out a pretty crucial portion of the story. You see, there came a point in the battle after hours of fighting where Moses was unable to hold his arms up. Through exhaustion, Moses dropped his arms. He wasn't able to hold his arms up anymore. And the Israelites began to lose. I imagine that shame came across Moses. I can't hold up a stick, and so I'm letting my brothers and sisters die because of my weakness. But Moses wasn't alone. The great news is that Aaron and her were there. They held up Moses' arms when the weight of the stick became too much. They knew that, that one man's strength failing was enough to cause all of them to fall. And so they stepped in. At the time of Paul's letters to the Ephesians then, too, Rome was one of the mightiest empires in the world. And a large part of that success was the unity of their battle strategy. You see, when, when Paul was describing this armor, one of the most important components of it was, was the shield. When the Roman army would line up, they had a very short sword or a very short spear that they would have, but very large shields. And what they'd do is they'd stand shoulder to shoulder, and half of their shield would cover their body, and half of the shield would cover the body of the man next to them. 
See, they would form this impenetrable line, this impenetrable wall of soldiers that allowed them to conquer most of Europe, but only if every man trusted that if they covered the man next to him, their man on their right would cover them as well. Anytime they would, they would pull that shoulder, pull the shield closer to them to try to protect themselves, they would leave a man exposed, a man broken, a man hurting. And this is why the armor of God is in Ephesians, the book that talks about unity in Christ. This is why just a chapter earlier, earlier, we read about family structures. We read about power dynamics because when, when he talks about unity, when he talks about standing in a line and shielding your brother, it means giving up every sort of dynamic, every sort of power that we hold on to and saying this person next to me is just important, if not more important than me. I need to shield them. Because I know that when the time comes, I will be shielded by them. And it's for this reason that Paul says to just stand. Because if one man fell, if one man went out and tried to take on the whole army by himself, it left a gap in the line. Not only would it leave one man down or one man alone on the battlefield, it would expose the brother to his left and his brothers and sisters behind him that he was meant to shield, that he was supposed to hold the shield for. Ephesians 5 then is not about how the church how the body believers, how the families are supposed to be run. It's about how we are supposed to give up our power. Because you can read Ephesians 5 and say, all right, a man is supposed to submit to his husband and just stop there. But, But it's really more. It says, a woman who is given less by society, who is placed under by society, is supposed to wreck. But here's here's the better part. The man who has been given more power by society, and you can insert anything there. Men in a patriarchal system. White people in a system of racism. Those with money and those without, it doesn't just have to be wives and husbands. Any of those people can fit into that because it's about meeting each other. It's about standing together. And so we stand. This is why we plant ourselves in the scriptures together. And soak up the truth. This is why we share the truth of those of our brothers and sisters that are falling so that we can hold them up, pull them up. This is why we, we pray for our brothers and sisters to hold them up, pull them up. Why we stand in the pain of failing arms and failing knees Because sometimes our family members just need bodies to fall on. In those moments of pain, in those moments of suffering, sometimes we just need to fall on each other. Because know that there will always be times when we need the same thing. Just stand together. Last Friday marked 57 years since Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and social activists marched on Washington to demand justice. Two days ago, we, we saw as thousands again marched demanding the same justice 
for social injustice, for police brutality. Mourning again as another man, Jacob Blake, was shot. Demanding justice for corrupt and broken systems, demanding justice for countless lives lost and families ruined. And I think it can be easy. It pains me to say that it's easy to dismiss these things, to, to explain them away as either political biases or, or misinformed facts. And it pains me even more to say that so much of the church has, has done that, has been, been doing that. That, that this is just one side trying to, to mar the image of the other. But the truth is, is that do, when we dismiss these facts, when we dismiss that there is someone broken, there is people that are broken and falling, we let a man, we let a brother or a sister, a family member fall down the line, and we let our family become exposed and uncovered, not held. For it was Reverend Dr. King who said, when we do nothing is it's bad, as bad as those who inflict the pain. It's him who said, we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and the indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. Who sit and say, wait on time. Because he knew that we, as the body of believers, the the church, the representation of Christ and his grace and his mercy, He knew that we cannot stand in unity. We cannot survive. Knowing that one of our comrades is hurting, broken, falling, scared, or dying, and doing nothing. A house divided, a church divided, cannot stand. So let us stand. Let us stand knowing that we stand. Stand firm, planted, because Jesus is out there doing the fighting for us. Let us stand as one, stand together at the end, knowing that the only way to stand as one is to stand with the least of these. To stand with the hurting and the poor. Let us stand knowing that when we let one fall, we all fall. So let us Let us all, having done everything, having endured everything, stand firm. Lord God, wonderful Savior, divine lover, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time to engage in your word and your story and your truth. Let the seeds that you scatter not fall on deaf ears or closed hearts, but allow them to take root and penetrate our hearts and souls. It is in your gracious name we pray. Amen.
So let us go. Let us go and know that we do not go alone. God has sent the Father. God the Father has sent the Spirit to be with us, to accompany us. Go knowing that we go with family to help us stand. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.